Come celebrate 10 years in the ultimate open world of Tamriel and play The Elder Scrolls Online for free, now until April 9th. Adventure solo or alongside friends on unforgettable quests slaying dragons, defending castles, and traversing wintry Skyrim or the mushroom forests of Morrowind. With no catch-up grind or subscription required and fun content no matter how long you have to play, start your legend today for free. Head to elderscrollsonline.com slash freeplay. Rated M for Mature. The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton for the stay. This is Book TV's Afterwards podcast. This week, Stephen Levy, Wired Magazine editor at large. He reports on the creation, growth, and future of Facebook. He's interviewed by author and Financial Times global business columnist Rana Faruhar. Okay, well, welcome, Steve. It is so nice to see you. I think the last time I we may have sat together in this way was when we were both working at Newsweek, maybe in the uh, the company canteen or something. Um, but uh, as you know, I'm a big fan, big fan of yours. I was a huge fan of your first uh, book on Google, In the Plex. And now to come back at this particular moment and talk about Facebook, the inside story, is um, couldn't be more timely. Uh, and, you know, I'm just going to start off. We have lots of places to go with this, but I'm going to start off with uh, something timely, you know, literally this morning as we as we came to do this show, um, you heard about uh, the hacking of, of Twitter uh, the fact that Trump has now gone to Facebook to get his message out. Um, you know, Facebook, <laughs> Facebook's had a lot of criticism for a lot of things over the years. And, and I, I actually wrote a column recently really questioning my, why Mark Zuckerberg has not fact-checked the president. Um, tell us your take on this. Where, where, wh- what is this relationship between Facebook and the White House, between Facebook and free speech? I'm just going to throw you a big question there to launch you off. All right, fine. Well, first, thank you for for doing this. And it is good to connect with you again through some virtual sea. Uh, (laughs) uh, So like a lot of things, you can't just tease out any one problem of Facebook from the its DNA and its origins. Um, In the case of Trump, um, obviously, he wasn't a, a factor in the early days. It wasn't something they talked about in the dorm room when they started it. But by the time the Trump campaign got rolling in 2015, uh, this became a, an issue for Facebook that was lathered on top of the uh, sort of the messy way it dealt with controversial content. And this first came up in 2015 when he posted, uh, when Trump posted stuff that was anti-Muslim. And it actually did violate, a lot of people inside Facebook thought, um, the company's community standards. But Facebook decided not to mess with that, to leave it up, even though it might have violated the standards and even though Zuckerberg himself thought it did, uh, because it was newsworthy and they weren't going to tamper with that. And that's when Zuckerberg started along the path that he really made very explicit right now is that he believes that politicians should be allowed to say whatever they want so people can judge them by their speech, even if it's harmful speech. And as time goes on, this becomes tougher and tougher for Facebook to defend because it becomes a bullhorn for toxic speech. And that's the corner that Zuckerberg painted himself into. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's so much front and center right now, too, because, you know, in recent months, a lot of the big tech companies have decided to take a different tact on this. This has been um, a very divisive issue. And and I'm curious, um, uh, when I when I wrote my own book, uh, uh, Don't Be Evil, I, I really focused on the loophole, um, CDA 230, which was the carve out from the mid 1990s uh, that gave the platforms that were just these tiny startup entities um, the freedom to be and say whatever they wanted to be, to be the town square, to not be held liable. But but Steve, all right, we all know as journalists 
these are giant media companies. And so I'm curious, as you really dug into this issue, both in your previous book on Google, but on this book on Facebook, where do you come out? Are these guys the town square anymore or are they something else? How should we think about them? Well, I, I think that 230 gets, you know, which is the, as you mentioned, the, the regulation, the law that was passed, you know, in 1996, uh, really way before we had these giant platforms um, that was to encourage internet companies. I actually don't think that's like the main issue here. The main issue is what is one of these big platforms going to do or any of them going to do to police speech to make a safe environment for their users. And I think 230 gives them the opportunity to do that. And it's a question of where they draw the line to do that. Uh, you know, Zuckerberg always says that, hey, you don't want me to be the arbiter of the speech of, what is it now, 3 billion people. Mm. And, you know, and no, he's not the ideal arbiter. But the fact is, he built this platform and he is the arbiter. He's mm. the person who has to decide what the, where the line is in what he'll say can't be said on his platform. This is toxic. This is going to make people feel uncomfortable. This is, you know, uh, absolutely verboten. We're not going to have pornography on here. Um, and we're not going to have misinformation about important things like uh, anti-vax information, which took Facebook a long time to ban, or uh, information about voting to discourage people in voting, which Facebook still doesn't do all that great a job in fighting, even though it says it's trying. Um, or, you know, things like dog whistles, like Trump quite often uh, sends out um, that certainly uh, makes people of color, color uncomfortable and makes the platform itself somewhat, somewhat toxic. So it's, it's a tough line to draw, but that's what he built. And he, and he, he has to own up to that. So yeah. I think that that really is the issue. And the fact is he's not doing a great job of it because the more the, the bad speech is exposed it just feels wrong and he has more and more difficulty denying it. And that's why he's constantly taking these little mini steps back when confronted with the consequences of where his decisions making is at a given moment. Mm. Um, I want to come back to disinformation, misinformation, um, free speech and elections. But um, first I want to just note, I love the beginning of your book because it, it painted this picture and you do this so well. I have to say, I've, I've, I've called you the David, David Halberstam of tech because you're all, you're always kind of getting right in people's uh, 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 lives and, and getting the details, but you're also painting this big picture. And the picture you painted was Zuck in Africa with these sort of adoring entrepreneurs, users um, around him, um, almost seeming in that anecdote to me like a head of state. And this is something that I always think about when I think about Facebook. You, you get at this later in the book, this, this point at which you w decided you wanted to write about Facebook, billion users on one day. I mean, now we know they've got more users than the largest countries in the world in many cases. So these companies, Facebook in particular, they almost seem like sort of supranational entities. Almost, you know, I think about as somebody that studies economic history, East India Company of old. Uh, mm. Do you do you did you find that, and what does that mean? You know, I, d I definitely found that, and, and as you mentioned, that I decided to write Facebook the inside story uh, when Zuckerberg posted in 2015, the end of the summer, that a billion people had logged into Facebook, been on Facebook, active users in the 24 hour period. And as again, as you mentioned, you know, the total membership of Facebook, even back then was larger than any country. Now the logged in, you know, number is bigger than any country is like, uh, they're approaching 3 billion people. Um, and when I started actually doing the book, it took me a year to get them to sign off to give me cooperation with no strings attached. The first I thing I hear about that, um, we're going to yeah, come back to that. Go ahead. The, we went to Africa and he, you're right. He was like a head of state and he came to Africa from Italy, where, of course, he met with the prime minister. He met with the pope. And this is like what you'd expect Mark Zuckerberg to do. And a few months before that, you know, Modi, the head of India, you know, he 
came to Facebook on a state visit. And, you know, so, you know, uh, Facebook had a foreign policy uh, and he was greeted like, you know, like a head of state and almost, you know, like some sort of God among the geeks of Nigeria. Nigeria has a very active community, a tight community of entrepreneurs. Yes. Um, and him coming there just blew their mind. It was a surprise visit. And I was like actually in you know, this little startup community uh, where he popped in and but was surprised. They couldn't believe who it was. And I realized later that that was kind of peak Facebook because only a few months later, the 2016 election occurred. And that really was the moment where the bit flipped for Facebook and it went from this revered company that it had a lot of issues in the past but skated by them. But from that point on, it was not skating by its issues. It just had to answer for all the things that it did that, you know, uh, you know, that were toxic, that caused people problems, that stole people's attention, that compromised people's data, privacy. Um, and that was the, the bit that, that flipped. And the book became an exercise in understanding how that happened. And that, mm-hmm. that made me actually go back even more than I thought to the early days of Facebook and even the childhood of Mark Zuckerberg to understand how this thing happened. That's fascinating. Well, for starters, I can I can relate as an author. Boy, that's a tough thing when your meta story changes in the middle of your book cycle. You really you yeah. have to scramble. <laughs> well, fortunately, it wasn't the middle of the book cycle. You know, yeah. like I knew it was going to take me a few years to do it. And yeah. in a few months in, it gave me the advantage of covering Facebook and interviewing you know the people at Facebook. I did hundreds of interviews there while this Thing was happening while you know the company's reputation was unraveling and watching that process you know in real time so what did you learn what did you learn about mark zuckerberg and his childhood uh that that could inform or help us understand where the company is today well i talked to his parents and his mother told me a story which i found really resonated with the way Facebook un- unfolded. Um, he grew up in Westchester County, um, not one of the more posh suburbs, but you know, a nice suburb. Um, and the, the public school he went to, though, didn't have a whole lot of advanced classes and a great computer uh, program. So he wanted to go to a private school, get a better computer program, take advanced classes. He was interested in the, in the classics um, and loved conquerors like Alexander the Great and Augustus <laughs> Caesar, which is telling in and of itself. Yeah. Um, his mother really wanted him to go to a nearby private school, Horace Mann, where he can commute. Uh, the oldest sibling in the family was going off to Harvard that year. His mother didn't want to lose two kids the same year. Uh, and But he heard about the program at Phillips Exeter, which would require boarding, and he he wanted to go there. So his mother said, listen, why don't you just like interview the people at Horace Mann, and maybe you'll like it. And he said, well, I'm going to interview the people. I'll do that for you, but I'm going to Phillips Exeter. And he went to Exeter. And that reminded me a lot of the decision-making uh, that I learned took place at Facebook through all its history, where quite often uh, something would come up, and his lieutenants might warn him against it. Hey, this isn't good for our users. Sometimes they would even say, this isn't right. This is kind of wrong, morally wrong. And he would say, well, let's go do it. And it's like, I thought, Exeter. You know, we're going to Exeter. So, you Move know, fast to break little, things came from Exeter? He, no, well, not so much came from Exeter, though actually that's where he first became familiar with a program called Facebook that had people's, you know, social contacts. But... Uh, but the idea that when he makes his mind up, that's it. And since he has total power at Facebook, he controls the majority of the voting stock. Even the board of directors can't overrule him. Uh, when he says, let's do it, when he says Exeter, they go to Exeter. That is fascinating. You know, speaking of total power, I'm thinking about this wonderful anecdote in the book about the eyes of Sauron. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the eyes of Sauron. <laughs> well, uh, he, particularly when he was younger, he had this habit. It was unbelievably unnerving that you could ask him a question and he wouldn't answer it. He would just stare at you. And and I think human beings have to blink a certain <laughs> amount, right? It's just sort of an 
issue of eye health, right? But he seems to defy that sometimes when he looks at you and, and, and stares at you. And a lot of people, Don Graham told me he had the same problem. Roger McNamee describes it at length in, uh, in his account. Um, uh, the first time I met him in 2006, I asked him some softball questions about Facebook, how many students are enrolled, et cetera. And he would just look at me and he wouldn't answer the questions. I thought, what's going on here? Am I in the twilight zone? Uh, he got better at minimizing that over the years, but every so often you'll get that stare. And, you know, uh, one of his lieutenants, you know, Andrew Bosworth, uh, known as Boz, uh, described to me as the, the eye of Sauron. <laughs> God. Um, that, that's really something. Uh, you, you mentioned Roger McMe. Um, he was also a source source for me. And in fact, I encouraged him to write Zucked, which was, um, yeah, uh, yeah. I connected him with, uh, with Andrew Wiley on that. Um, it, it's interesting. Mark because, Zuckerberg will thank you for that. I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, uh, it's interesting because when I first met Roger, um, he, he was going out into the media. Roger is, you know, for those that don't know, a, a veteran venture capitalist. He was a seed investor in lots of big, important tech companies. And he was sort of an early mentor to Mark. Um, and uh, uh, an Elevation had a stake, um, uh, I think, was it through Elevation they had stake in? Uh, well, first, the, the Elevation passed and, and Roger uh, invested personally. That's right. He didn't, in the later so, round, Elevation did put money in. But, uh, you know, uh, Roger benefited greatly from it in a way initially that his company did not. So, so it's interesting. So he was out talking really against his own book at that stage to the media and saying, look, I became concerned pre-2016 about what I was seeing on Facebook. I, was, I, I felt that there was something wrong here. I went, he apparently wrote um, yeah. a letter to, to Mark and Cheryl. He kind of, and this is sort of like, you know, your kindly uncle coming to you and saying, you know, Hey guys, I, th I think we have a little bit of a problem. And apparently, according to his telling, they went very corporate PR on him very quickly, shut him down. Um, it's hard for me to kind of metabolize how how someone can get that information from a trusted figure and not take it seemingly more seriously. In your reporting, what did what conclusion did you come to about this? Yeah, because Facebook really downplayed the degree to which Roger was an influence. Um, and I did look into this and, you know, uh, it's interesting. In, in Roger's book, I think he has the, a more accurate account of his, the degree of his influence in Facebook than maybe some of the media appearances he did. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, to have him described as uh, Zuckerberg's main mentor, um, which I don't think, if you pin him to the wall, he wouldn't claim, uh, is, is overblown. I did find that, you know, that the, some of the stories he tells are true. Facebook's first privacy officer, Chris Kelly, told me that he did connect Roger um, with Mark. And, you know, he did have a meeting with him when Yahoo was trying to buy Facebook. And, and he did have a role, but not the sole role, but a role among others in helping connect Sheryl Sandberg to Facebook. But by the time he was complaining, he had faded from the picture. He was not a regular advisor. Um, so basically they were getting a letter from someone who maybe was important in the earlier days of Facebook, but um, now wasn't someone who they were in close contact with. So they felt comfortable sloughing off his concerns to head Facebook's head of partnerships, Dan Rose. Um, and uh, the specific things he was complaining about were indeed under discussion at, at Facebook, but Facebook had already decided that it was going to not do anything about mm. the misinformation that was circulating in 2016. Um, you know, so it wasn't a new thing that he was bringing up. It was mm. something they already had made that decision. It was a destructive decision, I believe. Um, and Roger was right to call it out. Mm. Um, but uh, it wasn't like, you know, uh, Roger was saying, here's something you don't know about. It was something they knew about and already decided not to do anything about. And that yeah. was misinformation was happening during the election that, by and large, um, helped Trump and hurt Clinton. Why do you think, I mean, going deep on Zuck and on Sheryl Sandberg, who we'll, I want to get to in a minute, um, what made them make that decision? 
that's a big decision, particularly for, I mean, I don't know if they're liberal or libertarian, but uh, um, it's a big, big decision to say, yeah, we see this and we're not going to do anything about it. So you have to reconstruct the frame of 2016. Uh, three things are happening with the election on Facebook. The first is the Trump is using Facebook, you know, uh, in the way it's supposed to be used, uh, almost better than anyone else has in history. Uh, you know, Bosworth, who I mentioned earlier, you know, he told me he was in awe of it. This later came out in a memo, but he shared it with me during the course of the book that that it, it was beautiful. That essentially, Trump, the Trump campaign played Facebook like a Stradivarius. <laughs> where the Clinton people played it like, you know, the cardboard banjo you'd find in the street. You know, uh, the Trump campaign accepted uh, an embed from Facebook that helped show them the ins and outs of how to use it. Um, they made a bigger bet on it. And, you know, uh, they did thousands of ads every day, sometimes hundreds of thousands. And uh, whereas the Clinton campaign did not use it well at all. So that was part one. Part two was this misinformation that... People found that they could make money by circulating fake stories by publications that didn't exist, uh, that were basically made Hillary Clinton look bad and sometimes look criminal, like Pizzagate, where supposedly she was running a child trafficking ring in a pizzeria in in Washington. Um, And that would get people to go to some page where there would be ads. It was a financially motivated uh, campaign. And the third was... Russian involvement. And this, I don't think, had as much exposure to the users as the misinformation campaign. But, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of, of people who saw this stuff. And super disturbing that the Russians are using Facebook to help uh, meddle with an election. Um, and, you know, this sort of unrolled to Facebook really late and they really didn't come across it till I think after, after the election and we could talk about how they treated it then. But the second thing, uh, there was a big debate about Facebook. And at one point there was a meeting I described, it was the weekly Cheryl meeting. Yeah. Um, and the person really who was running that meeting was this guy named Joel Kaplan, who was the head of the DC operation, the lobbying operation. And his DNA was, he was a Republican. And a lot of people in the Washington office felt that he felt his job was to carry water for the Republicans. Um, mm-hmm. He had a very close relationship with Cheryl. He used to date her in college. And uh, Cheryl uh, was fully back from, um, you know, the tough period she had to recover uh, from when her husband died, a terribly tragic situation. She was back then. But I think things had shifted where people who – um, took on responsibility during that period, including uh, Kaplan, um, were pretty much operating with more authority. And he won the argument that they shouldn't do anything about the mis- misinformation. He said that would be like tilting the playing field to help one candidate by removing the misinformation. And that was wrong. The idea is the playing field was tilted by the misinformation and you would be leveling it by taking it out. Um, but he won the day and the rest is history. Interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about the revelations post 2016, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. You get deep into that as well, which was very interesting. How did you view all those characters? Well, I think the Cambridge Analytica was an amazing story in and of itself. And, you know, I undertook to, you know, tell it, like a story of the, the chapter's named Clown Show, because it was in a way a, a comedy, you know, in some sense of errors, you know, some errors on Facebook's part. But, you know, um, there were like crazy characters involved um, and that led it to what became the biggest scandal in that narrative in, in Facebook's history. Uh, you could argue whether other things that Facebook did were more damaging, but this is the one that got the most traction. And I believe that that scandal really happened, not in 2018 when it was revealed or 2016 during the election or 2014 when Cambridge Analytica got the information of maybe 78 million Facebook users, but in 2010 when Facebook 
gave away information about users to developers. And when that meant when a Facebook user signed up to use some uh, survey or an application from a third party that ran on Facebook, they would give that developer or the survey maker not only the information of that person who signed up, but that person's whole social network, all the friends. So, you know, you could argue that the user who signs up for a survey is responsible because he clicks off or she clicks off on, you know, some little boilerplate saying, oh, we're going to look at your information. But they give away all the information about person's friends who had no idea that this was happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, People at Facebook, again, Mm -hmm. they complained uh, to Zuckerberg. They said, this is too much. You know, we, we, we shouldn't do this. And Zuckerberg went ahead and did that uh, anyway. And, you know, kind of that, that API, as it's called, you know, that, you know, way to dig into Facebook's databases, um, you know, opened up in 2010. Um, they closed that loophole in 2014. But by then, Cambridge Analytica get, could get access to that uh, because there's one research for, from Cambridge University that was, you know, figured out you can get that information by doing this seemingly innocuous survey. Um, so that's how the information fell into the hands of one of the biggest funders of the far right, who then, uh, first for Ted Cruz and then Donald Trump, used it uh, in the election. Do you, are you worried that Facebook could have an uh, effect on November? Well, Facebook is going to have an effect on November. Um, you know, let's, let's, we, let me let me let me let me put it more dramatically. Are you worried that they could reelect Donald Trump? Well, again, which parts of it are going to be used? I think that the the Biden campaign um, is going to use Facebook better than the Clinton campaign did. They're not going to dismiss it like that. Um, they know what happened in 2016, but the. Trump campaign has a big head start and already collecting the data from 2016 and building on it over the last four years. Now, Facebook has indicated that they're considering cutting off political advertising. If that happens, that's going to be a giant win for the Trump campaign because they have this big lead that the Biden campaign could never close if they, they stop the, uh, the campaigning. You know, cutting off political advertising um, or labeling it, you know, this is this is all part of this deeper conversation, which, get, which I think gets into an economic conversation about these firms, about the black box, right? The fact that there's incredible uh, information asymmetry on either sides of these transactions. That was something I tried to look at deeply in my own book because it reminded me so much of the financial sector in 2008, where you've got these large entities that have all the information and the person on the other side of the transaction does not have the same amount of information. And, you know, Adam Smith 101, you know, markets don't work properly or fairly if there's not equal access to information, a shared understanding of the transaction and the value of what's being exchanged. How do you think about that? And, and, and let's start to delve a little bit into the coming, you know, possibly coming regulation of these firms and how it might play out. Right. Well, you know, Zuckerberg says a lot that you know, it's not money that motivates me. Um, and, you know, though I think, you know, obviously uh, <clears throat> Facebook's finances are Im- important. Uh, I think he sees it as a way that Facebook can continue to grow <clears throat> and retain its users. Um, that's what's important to him is basically dominating the social media space in the same way that Augustus Caesar dominated in his era. Uh, so to do this, they have a lot of domination, (laughs) you know, he he likes that. Um, he used to end his meetings by saying, you know, domination. Um, the, so the advertising model is the way Facebook makes its money. And there was that famous moment when Zuckerberg first testified before Congress and Warren Hatch said, I don't understand. You don't charge money. Uh, how do you, how come you make billions of dollars? He said, Senator, we run ads. Um, and Facebook says that these ads are good for people because we know a lot about you and we could show you relevant ads, which are things that you'd like to see um, and then could be a service to you. Um, and in some cases that happens, you know, sometimes you'll be on Facebook and they will send you an ad for something that is tailored to the things that you like that you wouldn't have known about otherwise and you might buy it. But they also know so much about you 
that advertisers can use that information to sort of probe your weak points, to manipulate you. Mm -hmm. And that is something that people don't want, but is part of Facebook. Um, And that's where things run into, into problems. And when people learn about that, they become alarmed about it. And I think that's the way the the Trump campaign uh, used Facebook in 2016. And I think that's the way political advertisers in general would want to use Facebook. If they feel that you've got uh, an underlying bias, they're going to exploit that to try to maybe instill some fear into you to get you to vote for their candidate. You know, it's interesting. I want to pull the lens way back here and connect a few different dots politically, technologically. Um, I sometimes feel that when we talk about 2016 and um, monopoly power in tech and the evolution of Silicon Valley from the mid-1990s onwards, all roads lead back to Sheryl Sandberg. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And she, but she remains... I wouldn't say a Teflon figure. She's certainly taken some, uh, take, come in for some criticism, but boy, she's good at not being in the spotlight. And yet I know um, from reading a close reading of your first book in the Plex, I mean, she was right there in the middle of developing AdSense. That was the, that was the golden goose, you know, that created and, and helped to um, monetize targeted advertising and really was the sort of basis of what we might now, or Shoshana Zuboff would certainly call surveillance capitalism. She then took that to Facebook, helped perfect it there. And so I'm always struck. I, and I have to say, I'm, I'm, rather cynical when I hear her in particular also get up and, you know, in these many congressional testimonies and say, gosh, when they're confronted with this or that latest scandal, we couldn't have possibly known. We did the best we could. Well, anybody who's read your book or frankly, how the chief economist of um, of Google, Hal Berrien's book, Information Rules, the playbook for this is all there. So yeah. Should we be blaming Cheryl more? I mean, she's she's also the connection with the Clinton administration, neoliberalism, winner take all economics that we're talking about now. Well, I mean, certainly she was a, a major participant in that, and in, particularly in the business model. I actually found someone who was with Cheryl uh, the day of her orientation. You know, when you go to Facebook, the onboarding process is you attend this uh, meeting. And um, usually uh, for many years, it was Chris Cox, uh, <clears throat> who was, and then now is again, I think, uh, Facebook's chief product officer, an early employee, who I think is, you know, the person who would probably take over Facebook uh, if Mark Zuckerberg left the CEO. Um, he gave a speech to inspire people. Um, and when Cheryl was on the onboarding session. It was kind of unusual. Here's the the person who was coming in to be uh, the chief operating officer um, who's in a new employee orientation. Um, They asked her to say a few words. And she talked about how ads at Facebook previously had been about uh, discovery because they were brand ads. And, you know, it wasn't like Google where you expressed your intent to search for something saying, I want to buy this something in this category and Google would know that because you were searching for it and be able to deliver you a much more targeted ad. Um, and she thought that Facebook could go there too. They could know enough about you if they have enough data to be able to do not only the brand kind of advertising they were doing before, but advertising from intent. And that's what she built with things like the like button and other things, which got more and more information about not only your behavior on Facebook, but your behavior throughout the web. So as you searched with a browser, that information would be reported and Facebook wound up buying other databases to get a more complete picture of you. So she definitely had a hand in that. And uh, she was in person in charge of lobbying in Washington. They made a deal of Mark and Cheryl early on that she would take charge basically of all the things that Zuckerberg didn't want to do. Uh, And those included that kind of lobbying uh, Washington policy stuff um, and the business model, uh, which Cheryl took over. So uh, definitely she is responsible for big chunks of Facebook. And I think Zuckerberg is responsible. And eventually he admitted that this probably was an error um, of not 
monitoring that stuff more closely because when things went awry in that realm um, and a lot of the things we're talking about during the election were in that category uh, it was below his radar and he wasn't able to marshal the resources to fight that when it was beginning to fester. Interesting. Cheryl, of course, was formerly chief of staff for Larry Summers, who was the big economic advisor uh, within the Clinton campaign, um, the architect of a lot of deregulation of the financial sector. And that, you know, the what was done in the financial sector and what has really been done in the tech sector, which is a little bit of, OK, let's just keep the market open, let the big get bigger. Um, you know, it's great for America to have more giant software companies. Yet there was, um, at a meta level, uh, not a lot of awareness that, all right, not everybody, or not a lot of admission, let's say, not everybody can be a software developer. We know we can't have an economy where you've got, I mean, Facebook isn't the best example, but like a WhatsApp where, you know, you've got a a multi-billion dollar valuation and 19 employees, you know, and burger flippers at the end. That conversation, particularly if you get a Biden administration, would seem to be coming to the fore. And in your book, you go back and you did look at some of the uh, regulatory battles that the uh, Facebook has waged with the FTC, for example, in 2011. Um, so far, it seems that the tech companies in general have been able to promise, oh, yes, we'll be better and go off and you know, maybe they get their hands slapped and then pretty much do whatever they want in terms of getting big, stepping on competitors, buying up uh, competitors before they can actually become um, real threats. How's that going to play out in the future, do you think? Well, I think the, the 2016 election, which which turned things for Facebook, and then you know they went into a, a reputational swan dive after that. Uh, and it took them a long time to really understand what was happening. And the 2017 was also the year uh, while this was happening, while people were criticizing Facebook more intensely, that he went on this pretty tone-deaf tour of the 50 states. <laughs> Uh, and did you go on that with him? I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't, you know, Sancho Panza's. He was traveling, you know, <laughs> through, but, but uh, I did, I did connect with him on a couple points in the tour, and I had a long interview um, in Kansas with him. I think um, uh, at, at, towards the end and in, in in the fall, it's um, you know, it, and that was a moment not just for Facebook. But Facebook sort of dragged down the whole tech sector with them because it became Facebook became the poster child for, wait a minute, look at all the power that these companies have. Um, what can we do about this? We don't like this. Mm-hmm. So I think what's called the tech lash really got underway uh, because of that. That was a motivating factor in that. And that's why the regulatory forces that you're talking about um, are pretty serious now, both on the antitrust side, um, the FTC side, um, and the congressional side. Uh, the people are looking closely about doing something about the power of the tech companies, including Facebook. It's interesting, you know, just, just today, just in the last couple of days, we've had a, a bunch of really major transatlantic rulings around tech. So, uh, the European Union was trying to get Apple to avoid tax dodging in Ireland. They weren't able to push that case through. We've just had Safe Harbor, which is the sort of sharing it, data sharing between the EU and the U.S. Um, that's that's off the table now. Um, some of this uh, and you know simmering simmering war about how we're going to do tax transatlantically. Um, some of that is down to this particular administration, but it also seems to beg these ex- existential questions of how tech is going to work and what the values around governing tech are going to be. It seems like we're moving to kind of what I call a tripolar world, where you've got the U.S., Europe, and China maybe going in different directions. One of the the, um, major advantages of these firms has been the network effect, has been the ability to cross borders everywhere, grow exponentially. What does this new, more fractured world mean for them? Well, it, you know, it's a challenge. <clears throat> I think Facebook is very concerned about uh, TikTok. Um, I think if Facebook, you know, weren't constrained, <clears throat> not only by antitrust concerns, but uh, sort of the geopolitical situation, uh, it would be doing all it can to buy TikTok. And they want to uh, release their own version of it. Um, and they've had mixed success in trying to emulate uh, competitors. So they have better success in buying competitors and integrating them into, into the Facebook family. Mm. Uh, so, 
<clears throat> it, is, it is a problem for Facebook, but if, when you've got such a big chunk of the world's population, like you say, there is this network effect that is very difficult to dislodge. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. I rem- I'm remembering about a year ago, a Senate hearing in which uh, I think it was a Reuters reporter that ran up after Mark Zuckerberg left at the desk and looked at his notebook. And, and yeah. he was being asked, um, you know, if anybody asks you about um, China or and a breakup of Facebook, just say that we're the U.S. national champion. We need to be kept big in order to compete with those Chinese giants. Is that do you think that's fair? Well, I think it's certainly an argument that plays, that could play to to that audience. Um, But I think it shouldn't affect the way we look at Facebook. We shouldn't say Facebook should be allowed to, uh, say, get away with more because we're worried about China. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I want to ask you a few personal questions about kind of your process on the book how you report, maybe you could start with the the fact that I think you said it took you a year to get permission to do this in the way that you did. What was that like? Well, so when I undertake a project like this, and I did a very similar thing with Google, uh, I think that you get the best information by talking to your subjects um, and talking to them quite a lot. And I found that really useful in the Google book and I wanted the same access in this Facebook book. And the access meant that they would give me, um, you know, free, you know, reign to talk to anyone I wanted to in the company um, and uh, be able to use it for the book. And, you know, uh, and no strings attached with that. They didn't get to approve anything in the book. They didn't get to read the book until it was already printed. Uh, I think it was like a week or two before the book was released to the public, but I let them, you know, see the the whole thing. I did fact check the book. I promised them I would fact check it, um, which I would have done anyway. Um, Hired several fact checkers to, you know, make sure that uh, we weren't making errors, uh, you know, then things I said, people said, they actually said. Um, And it was a question of saying, you know, uh, I'd like you to to trust me. And this is something that you should do, um, not just for me, but because you're so important, uh, you owe it to history. And in part because maybe that resonated, in part because I had been covering Facebook for a long time and had a good relationship with them, with um, Zuckerberg, with Sandberg, um, with Elliot Schrag, who was the head of policy who I'd actually worked with on the Google book um, that they said, okay. Hmm. What was the most surprising thing you learned as somebody that's been deep in this topic for decades, really? Um, I think it's interesting how Facebook was shaped so much by Zuckerberg personally and how well he managed to channel himself throughout his company. Um, I don't know if you've visited Facebook, the campus, but you go there and, you know, there's a whole lot of buildings, but in the, the main big buildings that Frank Gehry designed, you know, first there was one of them was a quarter mile long, and now there's two, and I think there's going to be a third soon. Um, they're all connected on the roof. There's a, you could do like a walk. It feels like you're walking outside in a, in a, in a garden because there's foliage on the roof. Um, there's all these posters um, it's very Orwellian almost. And there's a thing called the analog research lab where people silk screen posters with slogans, many of them taken from things that Zuckerberg says. Um, Mm. So it has this cult like aspect to it where he's able to get across what he wants throughout the whole company. Um, It is a culture to itself. Um, The motto for a long time was move fast and break things. They realized at a certain point that the break things probably didn't play well on a PR <laughs> standpoint. So they changed it to move fast with stable infrastructure, but move Not fast. Quite as catchy. Yeah. Yeah. But move <laughs> fast and break things really was the way they, they did operate. And, you know, they, it really literally referred to code, like you move fast. And um, if oh. you uh, took down the code base, you know, and the website didn't work for uh, a little while, you know, you could just reboot it because, you know, with new web tools that uh, Zuckerberg grew up with, um, he understood that it doesn't really matter if you have a bug 
uh, in the code because unlike with uh, Microsoft Word, for instance, um, you know, you don't have to wait months for the new version. The new version can come every 15 minutes. So, you know, uh, but metaphorically, you could argue that they did move fast and break bigger things. Uh, some people say democracy. I think maybe that's an overstep, but you know, <laughs> they, they, they definitely broke discourse to a certain yeah. degree. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, because move fast and break things is in some ways in the post COVID world. It's kind of the antithesis of where business itself would seem to be going. You know, we're a lot of talk right now about moving from a world in which companies are all about efficiency and and companies like Facebook are like the apex of that. You know, it's all about um, being a frictionless um, world. Very few employees growing scale extremely quickly, thanks to these technologies. We're now moving into a conversation about resiliency, which is everything from kind of really good corporate governance. And some people have questioned the governance of Facebook and whether Zuckerberg should have so much power um, to to the social corporate compact to, you know, how should the wealth of these I mean, the vast wealth of these companies be shared? Um, what would you say to that? And, and what's the conversation in Facebook about that? Well, I think what's startling is the depth of the conversation within Facebook about that. For the first time, Facebook finds itself, um, you know, uh, particularly Zuckerberg's and his decision making is at odds with a substantial chunk of the employees. Uh, it used to be that the idea of a leak coming from the weekly Q&As that Mark Zuckerberg did, where you could ask him anything and he would um, be very frank with his workforce about what was what he thought and what was going on. Uh, a leak was unthinkable. You know, that that wouldn't happen. And now um, it's routine. He has to assume that anything he says not only might be leaked, but a, a tape of the whole Q and A might be leaked as, as actually happened. Um, and it got to the point where uh, recently some of the employees did a virtual walkout. Um, it had to be virtual because they were working from home. Um, but they, 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 they stopped working in protest of Z the policies that Zuckerberg had about political advertising. And that's unprecedented in, in that, that company. So um, I think that is probably bigger than regulators, um, bigger than competition. Uh, that is a, a worry for Zuckerberg. He is a long term thinker. He thinks ahead. He bought a. a he spent a couple billion dollars for a virtual reality company because he thought that was going to be uh, the competitor in 10 years from now. And he wanted to own that technology. Um, so if he doesn't get the best engineers, the best AI people, um, the best everything, uh, he can't fulfill that vision. He can't compete uh, in the years to come. So he has to be very worried if he loses his, his workforce and, and they feel that Facebook isn't a good and moral place to work for. That's interesting. A lot of critics have said that it's not, as you say, it's not regulators um, or even the marketplace that will curb these companies, but the employees, because it's all about in these firms, it's all about human capital and who can get the best engineers to work for them. Um, there was a piece recently by Sam Lesson, who's a former um, uh, VP of product development at Facebook in the, in the information, and he posed some really interesting um, ideas about this coming battle really between the virtual world and the physical world and and this is sort of about the trans transition that we're now going through in the covid era kind of overnight we knew we were going to much more digital much more virtual an economy that was made up of intangibles and you know not things that you could touch and, and feel but that's now happened overnight and these two worlds come with different governing principles and it seems to me that facebook is a really good encapsulation of that. It's about um, decentralization, although ironically also centralization in the in the sense that you have this very powerful leader at the top. Um, it's about being cross-border. It's about being transnational. It's about um, kind of the opposite of the, the mainstream political conversation we're having now, which is very much about the nation state. What does Facebook tell us about where the world is headed? Hmm. Well, I think that's a great question. I think that, as you say, the virtual aspect, when you are on Facebook, you are in, you know, this virtual world, you know, the people talk about their friends and your, your social network now um, is 
something that is not based necessarily on people who you spend a lot of time with, you know, physically in the, in the same place with. And it may, you may even have close friends that you've never met because, you know, they're part of your network on Facebook. Um, and as Facebook tries to expand the ways you come in contact with that and your virtual world becomes your world, you know, as you say, is sort of teed up for this age where we're not supposed to leave the house much. Um, and that's important. But you mentioned uh, something else in terms of governance. I think Facebook uh, is trying to respond with that by uh, doing things like its oversight board, which it's forming, mm-hmm. where in certain very limited cases, uh, this board will have the ability uh, to overrule the ultimate decision maker, Mark Zuckerberg, on content decisions. Uh, you know, what individual piece of content can come up and come down. And the board might even be able to um, make a suggestion that's adopted about Facebook's policies. And this remains to be seen. It's taking a pretty long time for this board to, to actually be set up and start making its rulings. But uh, um, I think uh, around the time of 2018, not long after Cambridge Analytica, Zuckerberg started to think a lot about governance. And in my conversations with him, I had like nine conversations with him during the course of the book. Uh, at one point, it was brought up that yeah, he's thinking a lot about governance. Ask him about that. And you know, he had done a lot of thinking about it. And, and he he is a sponge for information. He's been, he contacted people who were experts on governance and, you know, um, gathered them for dinners in his house or had conversations with them. Um, so he could learn more about that. So I think he's trying to think ahead of the curve on that as well. Interesting. Um, where do you think Facebook is headed in terms of um, going into other industries? I mean, we've already seen them try and develop their own currency with Libra, which I frankly think in concept is a great idea, but I wouldn't trust Facebook to be, you know, I'd rather see some coalition of global central banks doing this. Um, uh, but it's interesting because it's, it is, it's pushing the boundaries of where we're going. Um, Facebook may not be the right um, player to, to run it. What else, where, where else are they going that we should be watching? Well, I think, you know, um, commerce and currency. I mean, they, they haven't given up on the idea, but they've had to scale it back. And I think, um, they really try to ram that through uh, their cryptocurrency idea in the face of an incredible skepticism uh, about the company. And, you know, they tried to you know, say, well, we're setting up this neutral uh, organization, literally in Switzerland, right? I mean, you know, it's a, almost a symbolic of neutrality um, that we're not going to be in control of it, though they created it and were, you know, um, the people who were going to, take advantage of it the most. Uh, I think that um, virtual reality, augmented reality is going to be very important for, for, for Facebook as, as, as time goes on. Um, and we're all waiting to see, you know, what people are thinking is inevitable, the idea of, of getting the information through these, you know, lenses, which bring the, uh, the virtual world, you know, um, literally right, 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 right up to our eyes. Mm. Um, and, you know, um, as more and more of what we do becomes virtual, Facebook wants to be right in the center of it. Mm. Steve, we've only got about four or five minutes left. So um, let me ask you just a couple final questions. Um, you know, the conversation about children in social media has really taken off in recent years. I mean, Facebook actually is, uh, I think, Kids kind of think it's a little old fashioned now. A lot of kids do. They've moved on to Insta or whatever, you know, whatever they're using. Um, should we worry and do you worry about the effect of these technologies on kids' brains, on their socializing? You know, I, I had a really interesting conversation once with a teenager that said, you know, I, I wanted, I, I was throwing a birthday party for my dad and I, I kind of wanted it to be private, but then I felt like if I didn't put a video on Facebook or on my other feeds that it wouldn't really be real. It wouldn't exist. I mean, it's a fascinating way in which they've just changed the nature of reality. Right, right. And, you know, Facebook, uh, as you mentioned, you know, is, you know, sort of not the social network of choice of younger people, but Instagram, which Facebook bought, we really haven't talked much about 
the purchases that, that Facebook made and Instagram was, you know, at the time they offered a billion dollars to this little company and is one of the great bargains of all time is still super popular among younger people and, you know, uh, an influencer culture. It's still at the center of it. Uh, uh, and as you say, a meal isn't real unless you take a picture of it on Instagram. Um, I think, though, it's tough to tease out how much of it rests at the feet of these big companies and how much of it is, uh, I wouldn't call it a natural evolution, but an inevitable evolution of this kind of technology coming in, into being, right? Mm-hmm. If there wasn't a Facebook from founded by Mark Zuckerberg, I think there would be something like it founded by someone else. The idea w- was in the air. He just managed to do it better. Um, the ubiquitous internet, high connectivity, mobile devices, these things just begat the kind of social networks that we have now and, and the kind of products we see with Instagram and WhatsApp and TikTok and, and other things. These were going to be part of our lives anyway. Mm. Um, you know, we're on this course and this is sort of my subject, you know, way before Facebook started, I've been writing, I guess, for decades now about this transformation of of the digital world on the way humans live. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is one piece of it, but it's massive. It's redefining who people are. So to me, Mm -hmm. this Facebook book is just one chapter of this bigger story, which I think is the story of our times, of this giant transformation. And I've been lucky to get kind of a front row seat to this major change. You really have indeed. You know, I try not to use social media too much, but I'm going to give your book a thumbs up. Um, (laughs) It really, really was terrific. Um, Last thought, uh, anything I haven't asked you, anything you want to leave readers with? Hmm. Well, I think what I tried to do in, in the book also was tell a story. And to me, there is just a great story to this very unusual person uh, developing something in his dorm room and very quickly accelerating it. Again, when he says, Zuckerberg says, hey, you can't blame us because we, how can we anticipate this in the dorm room? Within six months, he was in Silicon Valley being advised by some of his best minds. But how that used those forces I talked about, the internet, phones, other things, to accelerate to be such a, a presence in our lives, um, where as some impulses he had, which might have been considered idealistic, and other impulses, which might have been considered to be more than motive Augustus Caesar, um, took him to a place where, you know, he is in a way a stranger in a, in a strange land, and mm-hmm. uh, and is the object of really intense criticism. Um, and I finished the book with a couple interviews with him. I, I did that. We got to a level of candor that I don't think a journalist has gotten to before. And I used the, um, this notebook that I discovered that he had used in 2006 to outline Facebook. And, you know, uh, he had destroyed the notebook, but I managed to get copies of pages of it. And I wound up showing him his own work envisioning Facebook. And I feel he, he kind of melted when he saw it, he has to see it. I had a copy on my phone to go back in those days when things were simpler, when he had a small company that, you know, with nothing but dreams. And now the reality he has is much broader, but more complicated. Well, it's a rip and yarn, Steve. May the eyes of Sauron pass you over. <laughs> um, still on me, Rana. <laughs> they're still on you. I fear they are still on you. Um, all right. Well, it's been great to talk to you. I hope we get to do it again sometime. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Great questions. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also send us an email at podcast at c-span.org. Dot org.